Good evening. Thanks for joining. I hope you are doing okay tonight. Is this okay? Is the, um, is the video working? Is the sound okay? Is the PPT working as well? Can you just let me know in the chat yes, box? Yes, everything is good. Everything is good? It's Perfect. The audience is only me. <laughs> only you. Lucky you. That's going to be a VIP webinar tonight. <laughs> Definitely. Yeah. So then, of course, if you have any question, anything I can help you with, well, then you will have all my attention tonight. Thank you so much. All right, so tonight is um, probably one of the most important webinar that I have uh, organized so far because we will talk about uh, concepts uh, that are very often tested um, in paper three and paper four. We'll talk about price effects, substitution effects, income effects uh, in the case of different types of goods, normal goods, inferior goods. We'll talk about ordinary goods, different goods. So these really are key concepts and hopefully throughout this webinar, everything will be made crystal clear. Okay, so let's start and we'll start with something that is relatively easy. Uh, before we start talking about, about the price effect uh, that would be the consequence of a change in price, it is usually easier to start with a change in nominal income, uh, in the change in money income. And basically simply to look at uh, what's going to happen. So to focus on an income effect first, uh, and then we can consider the case of a price effect that is a bit more complex to analyze. So let's start with this uh, income effect or the consequence of a change in the consumer's money income. Okay, um, so the first question that we can ask is what is going to happen uh, to the quantity demanded if we increase or if we change consumer income? Well, the answer is that it depends on what type of good we are dealing with. Uh, if we are dealing with a normal good, then an increase in income will lead to an increase in purchasing power and therefore to an increase in the quantity demanded. Uh, if, we, if there is a decrease in income, then the quantity demanded uh, of, an in, of a normal good will decrease. So basically there is a positive relationship between income and the quantity demanded of a normal good, which means that these two variables, they change in the same direction. When one rises, the other rises. When one decreases, the other decreases. But if we, uh, if we have an inferior good, then it's going to be a negative relationship between uh, income and quantity demanded, uh, which basically means that if there is an increase in income, the consumer's purchasing power will increase. And as a result, the consumer will purchase or demand less inferior goods. Just like uh, the two examples that I use with my students to illustrate inferior goods, these are potatoes and bus tickets. If we have an increase in income, we are likely to demand less potatoes and instead to buy something that we like uh, best or just to diversify our diet. And same thing, if my income rises, I might use the taxi or the metro more often than the bus. So to me, these are good, good examples of inferior goods. Uh, okay, so of course, the consequence of a change in consumer income on the quantity demanded depends on whether we are dealing with a normal good or an inferior good. And this is a good occasion to relate these definitions of a normal good and inferior good to the sign of the YED, the sign of the income elasticity of demand. You can remind your students that normal goods have a positive income elasticity of demand and inferior goods have a negative income elasticity of demand. Okay, it's not about the uh, the size of the elasticity. It's not about whether it's bigger or smaller than one in absolute value. It really is about the sign of the uh, elasticity, uh, income elasticity of demand. Okay, so let's see what happens. And basically, I'm I'm not going to represent all possible cases. I think I only have I only consider the case of an increase in income. 
but I will consider two types of goods. I will consider normal goods and inferior goods. So we start from this initial budget line, BL1, okay? So same thing on the horizontal axis, we have the quantity demanded uh, of good X or the quantity of good X, let's just say that. And on the vertical axis, it is the quantity of good Y. But in this example, um, I, we will mostly focus on good X, but it doesn't really matter. Okay, so we have our initial equilibrium. So you see, I focus on uh, the quantity of good X. I could also uh, represent uh, Y1 star, okay? But usually it's enough to focus on, on one good, to focus on good X. So this is the, the indifference curve associated with the level of total utility TU1 star, which is the highest possible level of total utility that I can achieve given my uh, budget constraint and given uh, my preferences. Okay, so for this uh, income, for this uh, price of good X and for this price of good Y, I can reach the level of utility T1 by consuming X1 star units and the corresponding value there that I haven't even represented. Okay, now let's consider a change in income. So delta is for change, W is for the money income, uh, nominal income. Uh, and positive means that it is an increase in income. So um, the, the webinars that I organized last week made it clear that when the money income uh, increases, the budget line is going to shift outward uh, along both axes. It's going to be a parallel shift outward. The slope is going to remain exactly the same. Okay, so that's basically what happens when we move from uh, we move from BL1 to BL2 when the money income increases. And therefore, it means that the consumer has a higher purchasing power. Remember that this is a Keteris Paribus increase in income, which means that the price of X and the price of Y have not uh, changed, which means that the consumer has a higher purchasing power, can buy more of X or, or, and more of Y possibly. <clears throat> we'll see, it depends on the nature of the goods, of course. But in this example, we'll see that the consumer will be able to reach a level of total utility that is higher than before. How do I see that? Simply uh, because TU2 is above TU1. And remember that the further away from the origin, the indifference curves are from the origin, the higher the level of total utility that they represent. Okay, so TU2 star is greater than T1 star, which makes sense. If you give more money to a consumer uh, and the market prices do not change, it will be always the case that the consumer is able to increase its satisfaction because remember that we assume that preferences were monotonic. So I can always increase my satisfaction by increasing my consumption. Okay, so now what is interesting is the new quantity of X. If it is greater than X1 star, then we will conclude that X is a normal good. Good X is a normal good because the increase in income has led to an increase in quantity demanded, okay? But if uh, X2 star, the new quantity of X is to the left of X1 star, smaller than X, X1 star, we would conclude that good X is an inferior good because the increase in income has led to a decrease in the quantity demanded of good X. But in this, in this example, we see that the new equilibrium point B is such that the corresponding demand for good X, the quantity demanded uh, of good X is greater than the initial level. X2 star is greater than X1 star, which means that the increase in income leads to an increase in quantity demanded. Uh, so what we can conclude is that good X is the normal. Actually, we could also uh, determine whether or not good Y is normal or inferior. It's actually quite easy. We just have to look at uh, the quantity demanded at point A and the quantity demanded at point B. Okay, so I can also label that a Y1 star. So this is the quantity demanded before the increase in income. Okay, and I can do the same thing. Can I copy and paste? No. And Y2 star, which is going to be the quantity demanded of good Y after the increase in income. And what we see is just like a good X, when there is an increase in income, the quantity demanded uh, of good Y is going to increase. So 
uh, we could conclude that both goods, good X and good Y, are normal goods in this example. Uh, okay, let's consider another case now. And the, the second case is going to be the one of an inferior good. At least one is going to be an inferior good. I will explain why it is impossible that both goods are inferior at the same time. Okay, so same thing. So we start from this initial situation. Oh, is this a decrease in income? Okay, sorry, this is a decrease in income. So yes, I did graph all the possible cases. Uh, so I was not as lazy as I expected. Uh, okay, so same thing. The A is the initial equilibrium. So X1 is the initial quantity demanded of good X. B is the final equilibrium point after income has decreased. So the budget line has shifted inwards, parallel shift, of course. So you see that in this case, the decrease in the consumer's money income has led to a decrease in the quantity demanded of good X. So again, we can conclude that good X is normal. That's exactly the same as before. And I could do the same thing for good Y. And I see that the quantity demanded of good Y also decreases as a result of the decrease in income. So again, both good X and good Y are the normal good. This is what we can conclude from this diagram here. Uh, income and quantity demanded move in the same direction. Okay, now I have the case of inferior goods. So same thing, we start from this initial equilibrium, point A, so there is a tangency between the indifference curve and <clears throat> the budget line. I have this quantity demanded of X, X1 star, and there is an increase in income, so same thing. The increase in income is going to lead to an outward parallel shift of the budget line. And I'm going to have this new equilibrium quantity, this new point of tangency between the indifference curve, or one indifference curve among thousands of indifference curve and the budget line. So this is the, basically TU2 is the highest indifference curve that I can achieve given my new income and given the market prices that ha have not changed. So I can uh, identify the equilibrium point that is going to be point B. And here I see that the increase in income has resulted in a decrease in the quantity demanded of good X. So we can conclude that good X is an inferior good. How about good Y? Well, we could conclude that good Y is a normal good. Briefly, I'm not going to uh, put everything, but basically we see that the quantity demanded of good Y has increased as the as income has increased okay and when you think about it as i said earlier it is not possible that both goods are inferior if you have more income there is always at least uh, one good that you will buy in greater quantity if marginal utilities are always positive it's not possible that you will decrease your consumption of both goods this just is impossible so if you have an inf if you have only two goods and if you know that one is inferior then you can conclude that the other is necessarily normal okay uh, so this was the case of an increase in income and i guess that i have also represented the case yes of a decrease in income so that's exactly the same idea we start from this initial equilibrium we decrease the consumer's money income. The budget line is going to shift inward and we will have a new equilibrium point, point B, which is on the highest achievable indifference curve. Uh, and in this case, I see that uh, as a result of the decrease in income, the quantity demanded of good X has increased. Okay, So we can conclude that good X is indeed an inferior good, decrease in income, increase in quantity demanded. And what about good Y? Well, we see that the quantity demanded of good Y has decreased as a result of the decrease in income. So of course, good Y here is a normal good. Okay, good. Good X is inferior. Not too hard, right? Any, any questions at that stage? Or should, should I move on? Is it okay? Yes, please. Okay. So now the price effect is a bit more tricky because there are actually two things that happen in the mind in the mind of the consumer when you change the price of one particular good. 
Uh, and to simplify, we will only consider changes in the price of X, okay? Because we only need to change one price. It's, we could, of course, see what happens if we change the price of Y. The budget line would not shift the same way. We would need to identify price effect, income effect, and substitution effect on the vertical axis instead of the horizontal axis. So it is perfectly possible we can do that, but this is not something that is necessary for A2. We can also con distinguish between the direct effects and the cross effect. Uh, but again, this is not something that we do in, uh, in A2, so I will sim simply uh, skip all that and I'll simply try to focus on the main, main ideas that your students must know. So what is a price effect? It's not very complicated. It is just the difference between the quantity demanded after a change in price and before the change in price. That's it. So, that's it. so the price effect is the change in the optimal quantity demanded of one good. So if we change the price of good X, it is going to be the change in the quantity demanded of good X that follows a change in price. So that's basically the new quantity uh, demanded, the new optimal quantity at the new price minus the old quantity demanded at the old price. That is what we call a price effect. And looking at the sign of the price effect, we can determine whether the good that we are dealing with is ordinary or different. An ordinary good is simply a good whose demand is downward sloping. We can put it this way. So if we increase the price, the quantity demanded will decrease. So the price effect will be negative. And if we decrease the price, the quantity demanded will increase. So the price effect will be positive. This is what we call an ordinary good, uh, a good for which the law of demand is satisfied. A different good is the opposite. It's, it's a good whose demand is upward sloping. So the law of demand is not satisfied. So basically, in, in the case of a different good, if you increase the price, the quantity demanded will increase. So we would have a positive price effect. And if you decrease the price, the quantity demanded would decrease. We would have a negative price effect. Okay, so I give the definitions there of an ordinary good and a different good. Easy. You see, so far, I do not distinguish yet between substitution effect and income effect. Uh, okay, so if we increase the price of good X, this is basically a summary. If we increase the price of good X, if good X is an ordinary good, then the price effect is negative because the quantity demanded will decrease. But if good X is a different good, and if we increase the price of X, the price effect is positive. The quantity demanded will increase extension of the demand, if you want. And if we decrease the price of X, again, it's a summary, but it's always good to consider all the possible cases just to see if your students uh, uh, get it right. If you decrease the price of X, and if you deal with an ordinary good, then the price effect will be positive, increase in quantity demanded, extension of demand. But if you are dealing with a different good, and if you decrease the price of good X, then the price effect will be negative. This would be a contraction of the demand, a decrease in the quantity demanded. Can we identify all that on a diagram? Yes, absolutely. We can graph the diagram of a different good and the graph of a, an ordinary good. So make sure your students really remember, understand the difference between a normal good and an ordinary good. It's completely different. Even though all normal goods are ordinary. So it's not completely different, but we'll see that later. So same thing, we start from uh, an initial equilibrium, point A, with an initial quantity of good X. Again, you see, I don't even represent the quantity of Y. I focus on the price effect for uh, good X. And uh, what, I'm, what, I'm going, what I'm going to do now is to decrease the price of X. So your students should be familiar with all the possible shifts or the budget line. If we decrease the price of X, the budget line is going to shift outward along the horizontal axis. I should know that. And the vertical intercept will remain the same. Good. So now we can uh, represent the new equilibrium. So that's going to be on a higher indifference curve. Why? Simply because with a decrease in the price of good X, again, that's uh, Keteris Paribus 
decrease in the price of X. So the consumer's purchasing power increases. And with this greater purchasing power, it will be able to increase its satisfaction. Okay, so we have this new equilibrium point B. And in this case, what, what I am interested in is the consequence of the change in the price of good X on the quantity demanded of good X. And here what we see is that the quantity demanded of good X has increased as the price of X has decreased. So the price effect is positive when we decrease the price of X and therefore we conclude that X is an ordinary good. Decrease in price leads to an increase in the quantity demanded. The demand curve is indeed the downward sloping. What happens in the case of an increase in the price of X? So this is a symmetric case. So the, the, so the budget line is going to shift inward along the horizontal axis from BL1 to BL2. Same thing, we will have a new equilibrium at point B uh, that is going to be on a lower indifference curve because the purchasing power is now lower. So the level of satisfaction will fall. And what is interesting there is that, is that as a result of the increase in the price of X, the quantity demanded of X has decreased. So again, we can conclude that good X is an ordinary good, increase in price, decrease in quantity demanded. The law of demand is satisfied. The demand curve is downward sloping. So these are um, the most typical cases and they are usually not complicated to graph. Um, if your students graph these type of diagrams without really thinking of whether they want to represent an ordinary good or different good, 99% uh, of the time they will graph even without realizing it, they will represent the case of an ordinary good simply because it is less tricky to represent than for the case of a different good. Now let's consider the case of a different good. So same thing, we start from an initial equilibrium point A, quantity demanded of X is X1 star, and we will decrease the price of X. So same thing, when we decrease the price of X, the budget line is going to shift outward along the horizontal axis. And we are now going to reach a new equilibrium point. So you see that my indifference curve uh, have a weird shape, but they do not cut each other, right? They do not intersect each other. Uh, they are decreasing and convex. So make sure that your students do not do, uh, make sure that your students graph their indifference curve right. So they should always be decreasing, uh, convex and never cut each other, never intersect each other. So in this case, same thing, TU2 is above TU1, the decrease in price leads to a higher purchasing power that can be transformed into higher total utility. So we have a new equilibrium point, point B, and here, what is interesting is that the decrease in the price of X has led to a decrease in the quantity demanded of X. So in this case, we can conclude that good X is a different good, at least for this section, on this section, yeah? At least on this section, at least for this particular change in the price of X. The decrease in the price of X has led to a decrease in the quantity demanded. So the demand is upward sloping on this section. The law of demand is not satisfied. So this is the case of a, a decrease in the price of X. Now let's have a look at the last case, which will be an increase in the price of X. So same thing, we start from this initial equilibrium. We increase the price of X. So the budget line shifts inward along the horizontal axis. We will have a new equilibrium point, point B over there. And same thing, we see there that the increase in the price of X has led to an increase in the quantity demanded of good X. So same thing, the demand curve is upward sloping on this particular section, which indicates that good X is a, a different good. Okay, easy, right? Is it okay so far? Yes. Okay. Let's go on. So now let's let's uh, try to look a bit closer into the price effect, and let's try to identify the two components of the price effect, what we call the substitution effect and the income effect. So let's have a look at that. All right. 
So a price effect is always a sum of the substitution effect and an income effect. So basically when there is a price, this is how I explain it to my students. When there is one single price that changes, because we always consider uh, a change in price, all things, all other things being equal, Keteris Paribus. So there are two things that happened. On the one hand, when one price changes, this will modify what we call the relative prices. So to simplify, let's just consider the case of two goods. If you have the price of one good, let's say good A or good X, the price of X increases, then good X becomes relatively more expensive than good Y. And if the price of X decreases, then good X becomes relatively cheaper than good Y. And in this case, we know what's going to happen. We know that because of the equimarginal principle, if a good becomes relatively cheaper, consumers will want to buy more of this good and less of the other in order to restore the equimarginal principle. And if a good becomes relatively more expensive because its price rises, then consumers will want to consume less of this good and more of the other, again, in, in order to restore the equimarginal principle. So the bottom line about the substitution effect is simply to say that when a price changes, consumers will buy more of the good that has become relatively cheaper and less of the good that has become relatively more expensive. And what's good about the substitution effect is that this is always true. It doesn't matter if you are dealing with an ordinary good or a different good, a normal good, an inferior good, it's always the case. You buy more of what has become cheaper, you buy less of what has become more expensive. That's it. But when the price of one good changes, there is also a consequence on your purchasing power because your income has not changed. Your money income has not changed, but your real income, the purchasing power of your money income has changed. If the price has increased, then your purchasing power has decreased. In this case, are you going to buy more or less of good X? It depends on whether good X is a normal good or an inferior good, as we explained before, if your purchasing power decreases, and if good X is a normal good, then you will buy less. But if your purchasing power decreases and good X is an inferior good, then you will buy more according to the income effect. This is what the income effect will tell you. So basically the substitution effect is about the change in relative prices, and the income effect is about your change in purchasing power. Okay, I think usually when you give this type of explanations, students get it. So PE is SE plus IE, okay? What is the substitution effect is the change in quantity demanded due only to a change in relative prices controlling for the change in consumer real income. So we focus only on the change in relative prices and we control, which means that we will basically compensate and that's why we call the, the, the Hicksian demand curve for those who have uh, perhaps studied economics a bit longer at university, uh, the Hicksian demand curves who only include the substitution effect are also called the compensated demand because we compensate the change in the consumer's real income so it can keep its initial level of total utility. But this is a bit more advanced. So we control for the change in purchasing power. So we, we leave it aside so we can solely or only analyze the consequence of the change in price on the quantity demanded due to the substitution effect. So according to the substitution effect, it's very simple. Consumers will purchase more of the goods that have become relatively cheaper and less of the goods that have become relatively more expensive. And one very simple way you can explain it is to use the equimarginal principle. It is perfectly fine. The equimarginal principle is only about the substitution effect. It does not deal with the income effect at all. 
And the income effect, it is simply the change in quantity demanded that is due only to a change in real income, the change in purchasing power. So in this case, what we control is the change in relative prices. Okay, so we, we divide the two effects. We focus on the change in relative prices, so we measure the substitution effect, and then we focus on the change in purchasing power, so we can measure the income effect. Unlike the substitution effect, whose sense or whose direction is easy to analyze, it is a bit more complicated to analyze the, the direction of an income effect because it will depend on, on the type of good that we are dealing with. Uh, as I explained here, consumers will purchase more normal goods and less inferior goods when their purchasing power rises due to a decrease in the price of a good. Okay, When the price of a good uh, decreases, the purchasing power increases, the real income rises. And on the other hand, consumers will purchase less normal goods and more inferior goods when the purchasing power falls, not due to a decrease in the money income, but due to an increase in the price of a particular good. Okay. So the substitution effect is easy to analyze because it always has the opposite sign of the change in the price of good X. Simply because if you increase the price of X, X becomes more expensive, so you buy less. Okay, so if the price increases, the substitution effect tells you buy less. And if the price decreases, the good becomes cheaper. So the substitution effect tells you buy more. Uh, perhaps something that can help your students is really to uh, imagine that you, you have um, this substitution effect and income effect are two people that tell you two different messages. Sometimes they tell you, they give you the same message, buy more or buy less. And uh, and sometimes they will give you uh, contrasting messages. One will tell you buy more and one will tell you buy less. So you can actually even play a game with your students when you will tell one student you are the substitution effect and the other student you are the income effect. And you give, uh, you give them some situations. The price of a normal good has increased or something like that. And then you ask your effect, your students, what they should tell you, what you should do. Uh, okay. So quite easy with uh, the sign of the substitution effect. So for the income effect, we need to distinguish between normal goods and inferior goods. So if it's normal, then just like the substitution effect, the income effect has the opposite sign of the change in the price of X. So if the price of X increases, your purchasing power decreases, and therefore you will buy less of normal goods. So you see, if price increases, quantity demanded decreases, opposite sign. And if the price decreases, your purchasing power increases, and therefore you buy more normal goods. So again, a negative relationship. But uh, if good X is inferior, then the income effect has the same sign as the change in the price of good X. So the price of X increases, so your purchasing power decreases. And if your purchasing power decreases, you buy more inferior goods. So when the price increases, you buy more inferior goods, positive relationship. And when the price decreases, your purchasing power increases. And therefore, with a higher purchasing power, you buy less inferior goods. So when the price decreases, you buy less inferior goods. Again, you see you have a positive relationship between price and quantity demanded according to uh, the income effect. So there is something quite interesting. You see that in the case of a normal good, the, the substitution effect and the income effect will give, send you the same message. They will tell you either buy more or buy less. Basically, they will agree. They will work in the same direction. So in this case, the sign of the price effect is clear cut. If you have the two effects that tell you buy more, uh, if the price decreases in the case of a normal good, or if you have the two effects that tell you buy less when the price of a normal good increases, then we know that the, what you, we know that the price effect will be negative if the price rises and positive if the price decreases. So no problem. And that's why we can find out that all normal goods are ordinary. 
this is the consequence of that because the income effect and the substitution effect work in the same direction. They reinforce each other. But in the case of an inferior good, these two effects will work against each other. They will send you different messages. One will tell you buy more and one will tell you buy less. So at the end of the day, the sign of the price effect is not clear. We don't know whether we will have an ordinary good or a different good. It will depend on which effect is the strongest. So if we let, let's just uh, think of what happens there. So let's say the price of X increases. Okay. And good X is an inferior good. So let's focus on the, on what the substitution effect will tell me if the price effect, sorry, if the price of X increases, the substitution effect will tell me buy less. Okay. Good X has become relatively more expensive. So according to the substitution effect, I should buy less. How about the income effect? So remember that good X is assumed to be an inferior good. If the price of X rises, then my purchasing power decreases. And if good X is an inferior good with a lower purchasing power, the income effect will tell me buy more. So the substitution effect tells me buy less, but the income effect tells me buy more. Huh? So what's going to be the overall price effect? Is it going to be positive or negative? Of course, the answer depends on which effect is going to be the dominant, which one will be the strongest. Okay, let's summarize these ideas in the next slide. So if good X is normal, then both effects, S, E, and I, E, work in the same direction. They are both negative if PX increases. So in this case, the price effect will be negative. We know that the good is going to be ordinary and they are both positive if the price of X falls. The consequence, as I explained, is that all normal goods are ordinary. If you know that the, you are dealing with the normal good, you know that the law of demand will always be satisfied. The opposite is not true. If you know that the good is ordinary, you cannot tell for sure if the good is normal or inferior. Be careful. It's, a, uh, it's an implication, but this is not an equivalence. But if good X is inferior, then SE and IE have opposite signs. They send you different messages. For example, if you increase the price of X, the substitution effect tells you buy less. So the substitution effect is negative, but the income effect tells you buy more. The, the income effect is positive. And if the price of X falls, it becomes cheaper. So the substitution effect tells you buy more positive substitution effect, but the income effect will tell you buy less because your purchasing power has increased. And with a higher purchasing power, you buy less inferior goods than before. So you see that they send different messages. So overall inferior goods, they can either be ordinary or different depending on the relative strength or size, the relative size of the income effect and the substitution effect. Basically, if the substitution effect is the strongest. I'm watching, right? Hello, you get a question? All right, let's keep going. If the substitution effect is the strongest, then in this case, it's easy to see that the good is going to be ordinary. I'm going to show you that in a second. But if it is the income effect that is stronger, then the good is going to be different. Okay, let's focus on what we have there, what we have there, th this line there. Uh, let's say that we increase the price of X. Okay, so the substitution effect will tell me buy, buy less and the income effect will tell me, tell me buy more. If, if the good is ordinary, then the increase in price should lead to a decrease in the quantity demanded. Okay, so the overall price effect should be negative in the case of an ordinary good. The overall price effect will be negative if the substitution effect, the one that tells me buy less, is indeed stronger than the income effect who tells me buy more. 
So we see that if the substitution effect is stronger than the income effect, then we, in, we do indeed have a negative price effect in the case of an increase in the price of X. And therefore the demand is indeed downward sloping. We have an ordinary good. But if the income effect is stronger than the substitution effect, again, in the example of an increase in the price of X, then in this case, the effect that tells me by more is stronger than the effect that tells me, tells me by less. So the overall price effect is going to be positive as a result of an increase in the price of X, which means that the quantity demanded increases as the price increases. So I do, I am dealing with a different good. Okay, an example. I have uh, come up with this example with uh, beer and wine to illustrate all that. So let's consider the case of John. Uh, he can only purchase two goods, beer and wine. So if you think it's not appropriate for your students, you can replace by a uh, Coca-Cola and, uh, and, uh, and Fanta or Pepsi, uh, whatever. Uh, so assume th that the price of wine rises Keteris Paribus. So we only change the price of wine. In terms of what has happened to the relative prices, wine has become relatively more expensive than beer and beer has become relatively cheaper so according to the substitution effect the one that only focuses on changes in relative prices john should purchase more beer that has become relatively cheaper and less wine that has become relatively more expensive so it will substitute beer for wine and that's why we call that the substitution effect so the substitution effect that results from the rise in the price of wine is negative because the substitution effect tells John, A, hey, you should buy less wine. You should decrease the quantity demanded of wine. So that's what the substitution effect tells us. Now, with the increase in the price of wine, John's purchasing power, his real income has decreased. So then, is he going to buy more or less wine? Of course, it depends on whether wine is an inferior good or a normal good. So we need to make an assumption. I will assume that wine is a normal good, which tends to make sense in practice. We could even argue that it is a luxury. So if the price of wine has increased, John's purchasing power has decreased. So he will buy less wine according to the substitution effect because wine is a normal good. So the income effect tells John you should buy less wine. So you see that in this simple example, uh, because wine is a normal good, the income effect and the substitution effect send the same message and tell John that he should uh, buy less wine. Yeah. So the income effect is negative, just like the substitution effect. So the overall price effect is negative. So we can conclude that wine is an ordinary good. So the law of demand is satisfied. The increase in the price of wine will indeed lead to a decrease in the quantity demanded. Okay, easy example. Are we okay at that stage? Any questions? No questions? Okay, I will take this as a no, we can move on. Okay, it is, it is actually possible to connect, as I said earlier, the substitution effect and the equimarginal principle. Uh, some, uh, this, this type of explanation can be uh, useful in some essay question. So remember what the equimarginal principle is about. It basically tells us that we should have uh, the, the MU per dollar equal for both goods, if we only have two goods. MUX over PX should be equal to MUY over PY. So let's assume that we start from the equilibrium. Okay, so the equality is satisfied. And now we increase the price of X from PX to PX prime. So if we increase the price of X, then the ratio MUX over PX is going to decrease. Yeah. So in this case, the equality will no longer be satisfied and the marginal utility per dollar spent on good X will be smaller than the marginal utility per dollar spent on good Y. So if the, the equi marginal principle is no longer satisfied, it means that we should substitute one good for the other 
in order to increase our total utility. So now the question is to find out, should we substitute good X for good Y or good Y for good X? Well, in this case, you know that um, in order to restore the equality, you should consume more of good X, of, sorry, more of good Y and less of good X. So we should substitute good Y for good X. We increase the consumption of Y and we decrease the consumption of X. Why is this going to allow us to restore the equimarginal principle? Because as we decrease our consumption of X, the marginal utility of X will increase due to the law of diminishing marginal utility. And so the ratio MUX over PX is going to increase. And as we increase our consumption of good Y, the marginal utility of good Y will decrease again due to the law of diminishing marginal utility. So the ratio MUY over PY will decrease. So the left hand side will go uh, up, the right hand side will go down until the equality is restored. Okay, so that's what I explained there. The decrease in quantity demanded of good Y increases MUX. The increase in quantity demanded in good egg, in good Y decreases MUI until the equality is restored. So this process, this adjustment is only about relative prices. You see, we haven't talked about income. It's only about the fact that X has become relatively uh, more expensive, Y has become relatively cheaper. So we substitute one good for the other. And this adjustment only reflects the substitution effect and the change in the quantity demanded of good X uh, that results from this adjustment is not the change in total demand. It is a change in what we call the compensated demand or Ixian demand. So if you are interested of learning a bit more about that, you can just type that on Google compensated demand or Ixian demand, and you will see what is the difference between uh, Ixian demand and the Marshallian or uh, Valorazian demand curve that includes both substitution and income effect. But again, it is a bit more advanced. And I don't think it's, well, I know it is not necessary that your students know that, but I just think it's, it is interesting as teachers if we want to uh, know a bit more about how this works. All right, uh, I have the other example, of course. This is exactly the same example, but instead of increasing the price of X, we decrease the price of X. So I will let you have a look at that. This is exactly the same example, but we just reverse everything. Okay, uh, a few slides there are uh, one step further. Um, I, I, I don't know if I'm going to do that. So yeah, it's, it's a bit, it's not necessary. I just represent the substitution effect and how a change in the price of X will modify the position of what we call the expansion path, which is the uh, a curve that represents all the combinations of good X and Y such that the, the equimarginal principle is satisfied. So this reflects the equimarginal principle, but again, it is definitely not necessary to teach that to your students. They don't need to know what an expansion path is for Cambridge at least. Uh, if you want to know more about that, you can send me a message and I will be very happy to uh, tell you how this works. All that I'm going to skip it because it is far beyond the scope of the syllabus. If you want me to explain to you how this works, what it means, send me a message and I will be happy to explain to you how this works. But Together, let's try to focus on what is important for your students. Okay, so these diagrams basically illustrate the substitution effect only. And you see, by the way, that the substitution effect is represented by a movement along the initial indifference curve. So we stay on the same indifference curve as before. And that's why we call that the compensated uh, demand curve, because we compensate the consumer's income in order for our consumer to maintain its initial level of total utility. That's why we call that compensated demand. So if the price decreases, it's like if we compensate his money income so he can stay on the same low indifference curve, same level of total utility. And if the price decreases, it's like if we take some of your income so it, it, Again, the consumer stays on its initial level of total utility. Okay, but again, not very useful for your students. 
Okay. Now this is what is interesting for uh, to calculate and to identify this substitution and income effect uh, graphically. So this is quite important. So uh, what we are going to do is to define three equilibrium points. A is going to be my initial equilibrium point. B is going to be my final equilibrium point. And I will identify an intermediary equilibrium point that I will call point Z, point Z. I don't know how you say that, Z or Z. Uh, that is going to be uh, the quantity demanded after the change in price, but when we only take into account the substitution effect. So we haven't yet taken into account the income effect. So this is the change, the change between XA and X. Z only reflects the substitution effect, the change in relative prices, and the change from XZ to XB only reflects the change in real income, the change in purchasing power, that is the income effect. So this is how we can actually separate, distinguish on the diagram, uh, the substitution effect and the income effect, okay? So the substitution effect is simply the difference between XZ and XA. So when we move from XA to XZ, it is only the effect of the change in relative prices on the quantity demanded. And when we move from XZ to XB, it is the change in quantity demanded that results only from the change in purchasing power, that is the income effect. And then overall, when we move from A to B, so the difference XB minus XA, so this because this is always the new quantity minus the old quantity. This is the overall price effect. So of course, if you add SE and IE, you get PE. Okay, so that makes sense because the price effect is the sum of this uh, substitution effect and income effect. Okay, so now we are ready to, we call that decompose the price effect, which means to split it or to identify the two effects, the substitution effect and the income effect. Uh, so there are six cases that we need to consider. And this is the last thing that we will do today. Well, you see that it's not going to be so complicated now that we know everything. So that's the same thing. We always start from an initial equilibrium that we will always call point A. And we will always look at the change in quantity demanded of good X. So I only focus on X. I, I decrease the price of X. I'm going to go a bit fast because now I think we all know how this works. So we decrease the price of X. So the budget line is going to shift outward along the horizontal axis. We will have a new equilibrium point, point B. This is my final equilibrium, XB. And I see here that the movement from XA to XB, it is my price effect. It is positive. So I have decreased the price of X. As a result, the quantity demanded increases. So I can conclude that good X is an ordinary good. Okay. So, so far I have only identified the price effect. Now let's try to divide it between the substitution effect and the income effect. So basically the idea, I don't want to enter too much into the details, but basically the idea to identify the point Z, which is our intermediary or intermediate equilibrium point, we just have to find the point on the initial indifferent curve, TU1, at which the slope of the new budget line is tangent to our initial indifference curve. Okay, so sorry, it's not a very clear explanation. I'll try to show you. You see that uh, it's like if I take my, actually perhaps I can, let's, let's try to do something. It's like if I take, you see my, I hope you see my new budget line and I shift it until I reach a point of tangency with my initial indifference curve. So the slope is exactly the same. Okay. I can put it this way if you want. It's going to be a bit clear up. So this is my new budget line. And usually I use a ruler to do that. So I move my ruler. So I keep the same slope as, as the new budget line. And I look for the point of tangency up with my initial indifference curve. And this point is going to be up point Z. And the movement from A to Z 
only reflects the change in relative prices. So basically, you see that we move down along the indifference curve. So we buy more of X and less of Y simply because X has become relatively cheaper. And why are we still on the same indifference curve? Because we only focus on the change in relative prices. We compensate the loss, sorry, the, we compensate the increase in purchasing power. You see that in general, in total, when we look at the two effects at once, the decrease in the price of X allows the consumer to reach a higher level of total utility. TU2 is above TU1, simply because the, increase, the decrease in the price of X has increased the purchasing power of the consumer. And with this greater purchasing power, the consumer can increase its total satisfaction. So yeah, it makes sense that at the end, TU2 is going to be greater than TU1. But remember that the substitution effect is not about purchasing power. It's only about since one price has changed, should we buy more of X and less of Y or the opposite? It's not about our total satisfaction. It's only about how we, need to, how we want to uh, compose our basket in terms of proportions. Should I have a two thirds of good X and one third of good Y and so on. So it's not about satisfaction. It's just about proportions. So that's why when we move from A to, to Z, my total utility is a, remains const, constant because we have compensated the effect of the change in price on the consumer's purchasing power. So it's like if, as we move from A to Z, as if the consumer's purchasing power has remained the same, and therefore it will neither increase its total utility nor decrease its total utility. That's why we stay on the same indifference curve. Okay, so if you want to explain that to your students, you are very welcome to do that. If you have a better explanation I'm sure it's possible then uh, deliver the better explanation. If you just want to show them how to graph it, just tell them that you start from your new budget line, you shift it until you reach, let me show you again, because I really think it is important. Uh, which one is it? Yeah. You start from your new budget line. Let's just uh, change it a bit. Let's give it a different color. Uh, let's put some, uh, some black. Yeah. So you start from, you take the slope or you start, if you want, from your new budget line and you can shift it like a wizard ruler doo -doo 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 -doo, until you meet the point of tangency with your initial indifference curve and you label this point Z. That's going to be your intermediate point. Once you have point Z, it's done. You are good. You label the, qu the corresponding quantity XZ on the horizontal axis. From XA to XZ, it is the substitution effect. And then from XZ to XB, it is the income effect. So what do we see? We see that here, um, the substitution effect is positive, of course, because good X has become relatively cheaper. And we see that the income effect is positive. We have decreased the price of X. So the purchasing power has increased. And as a result, the consumer buys more. So it means that the good is normal. Okay, so this is what we can conclude. Good X is normal because there is a positive income effect when the price decreases. And ordinary because the price effect is positive when we decrease the price of X. So this is the first case. So let's just... To, to, in order to make sure that we know how this works, let's do the same thing, but in the case of an increase in the price of X. So now the price of X increases, so the budget line will shift inward along the horizontal axis. We are gonna have this new equilibrium point, point B, with the corresponding quantity X B star. So we see now that the price effect is negative. So we, we increase the price of X and as a result, the quantity demanded decreases. So same thing, we can conclude that the good is ordinary, no problem. Price increases, quantity demanded decreases, the law of demand is satisfied. So now same thing, if I want to identify point Z, point Z, uh, the only thing that I can do again is just to let me just copy my initial, uh, in my, my new uh, budget line. So I start from my 
new budget line, okay, PL2, and I shift it to do 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 until I reach the point of tangency with my initial indifference curve somewhere here, okay? And point Z is going to be somewhere here. If, if my diagram is accurate enough, let's see, point Z should be there. Oh yeah, not too bad. <laughs> okay, uh, and then same thing, I label the quantity demanded at point Z, X, Z, and from A to Z, it is the substitution effect. It's negative, of course, because good X has become relatively more expensive. So the substitution effect tells me buy less. And the income effect from Z to B is negative, which indicates that good X is a normal good. As the price of X has increased, the purchasing power decreases. And you see that the income effect tells me buy less, which indicates that good X is normal. And we already established that good X is ordinary. So these two cases are the easiest. So we have already completed two cases out of six. So now the only cases that we have to do is when the good is inferior. So it's going to be a bit more tricky, so pay attention. The method is exactly the same. It's just that the, the sign of the substitution effect and income effect are now going to be different. Let's do that. Same thing, we start from this initial situation. I increase the price of X. The budget line shifts inward uh, uh, along the horizontal axis. We now have this new equilibrium point, point B. Uh, no, I, we, I've already done that, sorry. Yeah, sorry, that's the same case again. All right, <laughs> I probably copied once, uh, um, one extra time. Okay, let's, this is our initial equilibrium point. This one looks good. Uh, we increase the price of X. The budget line shifts inward along the horizontal axis. So we now have this new equilibrium point B. The price effect is negative. We have increased the price of X. As a result, the quantity demanded decreases. So we have an ordinary good. No problem. The law of demand is satisfied. But same thing, let me show you what is going to happen to our, let to try to find our point uh, Z. So we start from the new budget line. Let me again put it in, in black, okay? I start from my new budget line up, and again, I shift it do, 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 until I reach the point of tangency. Tangency with my initial indifference curve. That's how you do it. So it should be, ah, I don't know if it's going to be very precise, but should be, Oh, you see. Uh, yeah, somewhere here. It's not super, super precise, but you get the idea. Yeah, about that. Not super precise, but you get the idea. Point Z. Now, and this is where it gets interesting. From A to Z, this is the substitution effect. From A to Z. And from Z to B, this is the income effect. Huh, you see that now they don't have the same direction. Of course, the substitution effect tells me buy less because good X has become relatively more expensive. Okay, negative substitution effect. But the income effect tells me buy more. So let's analyze what has happened. The price of X has increased. So my purchasing power has decreased. And the income effect tells me, oh, your purchasing power has decreased, so buy more which indicates that good X is an inferior good. But it's an inferior good, but we see that the income effect is weaker than the substitution effect. Well, in other words, the substitution effect dominates the income effect. So that's why overall the price effect is negative. That's why overall we have an ordinary good. So the good is inferior, yes. But it is ordinary because the substitution effect is stronger than the income effect. Same thing if we have a decrease in the price of X. In this case, the budget line shifts outward along the horizontal axis. We are going to have a new equilibrium point B and a new equilibrium quantity XB star. The price effect is positive. The price of X has decreased, the quantity demanded increases. So same thing, this is an ordinary good, no problem. The law of demand is satisfied. 
and same work you see same work okay let me do it again we i don't think we uh it's always worth it to do it several times okay so i start from uh, i start from my new budget line okay bl2 up and i shift it do, 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 until i reach this point of tangency that should be somewhere here with my initial indifference curve is this precise uh, not too bad yeah not too bad and same thing from a to z this is the substitution effect okay it's positive of course because good x has become relatively cheaper so the substitution effect tells me buy more and the income effect is from z to b it is negative okay uh, so what happens the price has decreased so my purchasing power has increased and the substitution uh, sorry and the income effect tells me buy less when my purchasing power rises which indicates that good x is an inferior good again but what is important here as uh, just as was the case before is that the substitution effect is stronger than the income effect so overall the price effect is positive when we cut the price so overall we have an ordinary good inferior but ordinary good it's a bit confusing with increase decrease positive negative income substitutions uh, so i hope i'm not saying too many uh, i hope i'm not making too many mistakes after almost uh, one hour and 15 minutes of, of webinar i will watch the video again and if I uh, can, if I spot any mistakes, I'll, I'll edit, I'll edit the video. I hope I did not say too many uh, incorrect things. Okay, final case, different goods. So it's the same thing as that really, but now the income effect has to be stronger than the substitution effect. It's a, usually a bit more complicated to graph it. Perhaps later I will show you how we, some stages some tips to graph it properly on a piece of paper because it's always easy on a computer but on a piece of paper it's a bit more challenging so i will share some tips with you to make sure you always get it right okay so we start from this initial point we decrease the price of x the budget line shifts outward along the horizontal axis we reach a new equilibrium point b a new quantity and here look ah we have a negative price effect we have a negative price effect when we decrease the price of X. So the price decreases and the quantity demanded decreases. So we have a different good. The law of demand is not satisfied. My demand is locally upward sloping. Not good. Well, not good. Weird. Let's just say weird. Um, so let's do the same thing. Let's try to identify our point uh, Z. Oh, I think I have a... Oh, hold on. My... Uh, PowerPoint, I think, I think my PowerPoint is tired as well. Okay, good. So same thing, I start from my new budget line. I hope the software will uh, remain alive until the end. Okay, and then I, sh I shift it da, 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 until I meet my initial uh, indifference curve. It's not super precise. It's always a bit difficult to graph should be yeah you see not too bad yeah point z is going to be there okay from a to z this is the substitution effect it's positive of course because x is cheaper so we want to buy more but now the income effect from z to b is negative and it is very negative let's put it this way it's a strong effect it's negative so what does it mean the price of x decreases so my purchasing power increases but the income effect tells me you should buy less, which means that good X is an inferior good, yeah? And what matters here is that the two effects have opposite signs and the income effect is now stronger than the substitution effect. And this is why the price effect is negative when the price of X decreases. So good X is inferior and different. Basically, all different goods are inferior goods but not all inferior goods are different goods. Think of that again, I repeat, all different goods are inferior goods because we need the two effects to have opposite direction, but not all inferior goods are different goods because it depends on which one is the strongest. Okay, and final example, 
same thing. We start from the initial equilibrium. Oh, you see, it's not great. Okay. Better? Ah, no, not better. Okay. Uh, that's a bit weird, but no big deal. I'll, I'll correct this later. So we increase the price of X, the budget line shifts inward along the horizontal axis. We are gonna have this new equilibrium. So the price effect is positive from A to B. So we increase the price of X and as a result, the quantity demanded increases, positive price effect. So again, we have a different good. The demand curve is upward sloping. The law of demand is not satisfied. Same thing, and for the last time, let's try to find this uh, point Z. So we start from the, uh, the final budget line. I'm just going to copy it. Boom, I'll change the color so we can see that better. And we are going to shift it until we reach the point of tangency with the, oh, with the initial indifference curve. So it should be to the left there somewhere. Yeah, you see point Z is to, to the left over there. The same thing from A to Z, it is the substitution effect. So it's negative because the price of X has increased. So X has become more expensive. We want to buy less. And from Z to B, this is the income effect. It is positive. So again, let's analyze what this means. The price of X has increased. My purchasing power has decreased. The income effect tells me by more, which means that good X is an inferior good. So X is an inferior good. And because the income effect is stronger than the substitution effect, the resulting price effect when we increase the price of X is positive. So we do have a different good positive relationship between price and quantity demanded. And I am done. It wasn't easy. It's a good exercise to uh, remain focused over a long period of time. Do you have? Nice to, do you have? Thank to, you. No, it, it goes very well. Thank you. Okay. It's very refreshing. All right. Good to hear. I think it is but a very important part of the syllabus. There are so many questions about that. So many MCQs, so many uh, essay questions that require this particular knowledge. So I hope that during this, uh, I have this organized three webinars on consumer equilibrium, one on budget line and in different curves, one on the consumer equilibrium and one on these effects. With all these webinars, your students should be <laughs> ready for any, any, any question related to consumer equilibrium. Just one last remark. You see, perhaps, well, I, I didn't talk about the relationship between marginal utility and the individual demand curve, simply because uh, I uh, disagree with the, the interpretation uh, that Cambridge makes of this relationship. Uh, Cambridge just says that the individual demand curve is the marginal utility uh, curve. And I don't think this is true, uh, simply because of course the individual demand curve does not only depends on preferences. It also depends on the income of the consumer. It also depends on the price of substitutes and complements. It depends on the expectations. It depends on many parameters. Whereas the, the marginal utility curve only depends on preferences, of course. So they cannot be the same. So I don't teach it because to me it is incorrect to say that the individual demand curve is the marginal utility curve. To me, they are two very different things. And I have uh, written and I have uh, talked to uh, several Cambridge uh, officials about this particular problem. Again, in my opinion, maybe I'm wrong. Maybe there is something that I'm missing but usually I advise my students not to take this uh, essay questions related to the relationship between um, MU and individual demand curve because it just doesn't make much sense to me overall. Yeah. But apart from that, I think I have covered everything. Any questions? Any remark? Anything else? Not, not from me, but really thank you. Yeah, yeah I'm, I'm new to teach this uh, economics, so 
I'm still in the learning for myself process. Yeah. But I appreciate a lot for your effort. You did a good job. Well, I'm glad, I'm glad you find this uh, helpful. And again, if, uh, if after this webinar, you have any uh, question about well, this content or any other content, you know how to contact me. And I will yeah. be very happy to, to respond. All right, thank you so much for, for joining tonight. Uh, I wish you a nice evening and a good night. And I will keep you posted when the next webinar is going to be scheduled. I will probably take a break for a few days. So it's not going to be before Thursday, for sure. No <laughs> webinar tomorrow, no webinar Wednesday, perhaps on uh, Thursday. And, and uh, the next webinar will be about production in the short run, which is the uh, following the next chapter after consumer equilibrium. I will skip behavioral economics, um, but I will, I will organize a, a special webinar on, um, on that, on behavioral economics and uh, heuristics and, uh, and all that, because I think it's very interesting, but I need time to prepare material for that. So the next webinar will be about production in the short run, and I will share the information on the WeChat group as always, and on the Facebook group as well. All right, thanks again. Have a nice evening and talk to you soon. Bye-bye. You, good night.